Welcome to Healthcare IT Today. I'm John Lin, together with my colleague and friend, Colin Hung. The world of technology and healthcare are ever changing in new and novel ways, and that's why we love this stuff. So join us as we discuss the latest healthcare and health IT news meshed together in new ways which help generate ideas and new perspectives. Plus, we'll have a little fun along the way. On today's episode, we'll be discussing, does disruption need to come from inside or outside healthcare? And be sure to follow the show on Twitter at the hashtag HITSM and our personal accounts at TechGuy and at Colin underscore Hung. Plus, check out our 16 years of health IT blog content at healthcareittoday.com. Are you a disruptor, Colin? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think disruptor, like other titles, are have to be bestowed by someone else. So I don't think yeah. I don't think you can self-proclaim yourself as, as a disruptor. Yeah. So and, and, and I even think if I, you're I, a I don't disruptor. think I qualify. <laughs> <laughs> you, you you use disruptive marketing, so I could give you that, right? You know, for sure. You you <laughs> you definitely have a creative skill there. So I'll give you the disruptive marketing title. <laughs> oh, cool. Thank you for that, John. Thank you for that. Yeah. No, I mean, it, you know, and also, you know, we've debated this a few times, like, does healthcare need disruption, right? Like, um, and, and you know, we've talked about that a couple of times where, you know, it, it is debatable, right? Like, we, we, we have uh, Dr. Nick, our friend, who's like, an, he calls himself the incrementalist, right? And say, you know, actually, incremental improvement is good enough. We don't need to fi get fixated on disruption in healthcare. Yeah, but what he you would mean? argue probably incremental over time is disruption too, but yeah. <laughs> It, it, there's something to be said about that only because we know how long things take in healthcare, right? So is, is healthcare even, is it even possible to be, to, to disrupt it? Uh, well, and there's an argument, right? I mean, the, I, I think it goes back to the ethos of do no harm, right? Like disruption sounds like harm. And so like, you know, the fact that we're disrupting healthcare, we're going to, oh, we're going to just risk that we're going to harm someone. And I, I think the challenge that many of us have is that we don't realize the harm that our current system is causing. We're in denial about that harm that the bad processes are having that are causing patients with health disparities to have trouble or that, you know, aren't getting access to the care they need or what, whatever it is. Like, I think we're in denial about how much harm our current system causes because we see how much good they are, right? And I think their hearts are in the right place and they, they're they doing everything they can to do that, right? And so I think that's probably the core of the issue is not realizing how much harm there is today and that, you know, disruption, you know, whether it's technology or workflow or business model or whatever disruption we're talking about, you know, that could improve the current status quo, may introduce some other harm that wasn't there previously, but that's better than our current harm that we're experiencing that we're in denial about. I like the way you put that. I, I, there's no doubt healthcare needs to change. And in some cases that change has is massive. Like it's gonna, it needs a massive change. Um, but to your point, I think disruption may be the wrong label or maybe a label that is not needed in healthcare because as you implied, disruption to me means blowing something up uh, and, and, and starting over, right? Or, or something comes in and it, it, it takes away from the current. Um, but but like um, like what you said, we, we risk there is a risk of harm here where if we blow something up, like what are the people well, what are the people who are using that now? What are they going to do if that's no longer going to be there? Like we, we have is the new system ready for that? right? Like so so I don't know. like you know, for me, is disruption needed in healthcare? I would say there's the need, but do we actually, uh, want a disruption in healthcare, the, my answer would be no. Like we want just massive improvements, right? Yeah. And whether you call that disruption or not, that doesn't really matter. We just need some really big changes. I think the real challenge to disruption as well is that there's so many people's jobs and related to that political careers that are reliant upon the dysfunction of healthcare. Uh, you know, it just like, for me, it hits the wrong way when someone says we're the number one employer in the city. You're like, well, I want my healthcare to be the like least employer <laughs> because it's not needed or you know, whatever. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Like, 
it shouldn't be a badge of honor that we're spending trillions of dollars or whatever it is on, on healthcare all this time, because it's become such a huge industry. And yet we kind of don't want to face the fact that if we truly were to disrupt healthcare, that means a lot of people aren't going to have jobs and that a lot of states are going to have a decrease in revenue, which may even be tax revenue or other things. Right. So I think that's something we don't want to face. Yeah, I, and I agree. I mean, it, it's to me changing healthcare uh, or disrupting healthcare is akin to disrupting government, right? Uh, mm. You know, in the sense that we, I think we all can agree, we don't like the way governments work. They're probably too slow, too bloated, too big. It doesn't matter what party you belong to or belief you have. I, mean, I think everyone generally just goes, yeah, that's it's the system can be improved. Too bureaucratic. Um, <laughs> but to your point, like many people have tried. Right. Many people have tried to to make changes to to government and the way the way nations are governed. And it's hard, right, because there's so much ingrained momentum. There's so many ingrained parties that that don't want as much change as maybe some of us are hoping for. And so pace is slow. It does change, but it's just it's very slow. It moves glacially compared to like other industries. Right. Uh, healthcare is the same way, hopefully to a lesser extent. Uh, you know, but to your point, there's a lot of embedded uh, regulations. There's a lot of embedded uh, ways of doing business that would, comp you know, completely need to be revamped. And like, how would we even replace the whole claim system? Like, for, I know we don't like it. No one likes this, right? Uh -huh. But like, how would it be replaced? We've invested so much into the way things are coded and the way things are submitted with clearing houses and all that stuff. Like, that's a whole infrastructure that something else would have to come along to replace all of that before yeah. we can make the switch, right? And it's hard. And think about the industries that will try to stop it, right? I mean, that's a problem too. I, disruption in and of itself is a scary thing because nobody likes change. Right. <laughs> we don't want to change or yeah, we want disruption as long as it doesn't impact me, right? Like, yeah, yeah. D kill everyone else, right? You know, as far as the change, make them suffer, right? Like that's fine, but just don't disrupt me, right? It's a, it, it is a bit of a selfish uh, issue as well. But yeah. you're, you're right, right? I mean, what could come along to disrupt it is a challenge. And I think there's also another interesting question. Uh, you know, whether you're on the incremental style, like Dr. Nick, our friend, you know, or whether you're looking at bigger disruptions. I think it's an interesting conversation as well to talk about, is it the inside leader that knows healthcare that can actually impact change because they know the players and they know how it works and they can actually influence change? Are they the ones that are going to disrupt healthcare more because they can do this incremental change or even, you know, big changes because they know the system or does someone from outside that has been through the technology disruption, for example, uh, you know, are they the ones that can impact change more? Are you an inside or outside leader is more disruptive? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think I'll answer it uh, with a little bit of a, of, of a faint and say, to me, it's, it's less about physically whether you're an insider or an outsider i think it's a mindset whether you're, mm. uh, that's really going to be disruptive so i think someone who has been in healthcare for 40 years but has an outsider mindset can disrupt healthcare right if they're always looking at what other industries are doing if they're open minded and seeing what's happening in the consumer world and going hey why can't we do that in healthcare mm -hmm. right i think so I don't think the fact that there are 40s years in healthcare is a negative. I think if, as long as they have an outsider's perspective and are open to new ideas, I think you can disrupt. Um, equally, I think if you haven't been in healthcare at all, but come in with some respect of what healthcare is and realize that, oh, things don't change on a dime here. There's a lot of interested parties and I have to get more people on board and there's regulations. Then I think you can also be a disruptor, right? I think the problem with both sides is that a lot of outsiders come in thinking that they can just be the bull in the china shop and things will happen and we we've, we've seen the the wasteland of people filled with like that tried that right and they yeah. just get so disinterested and so beaten down that they leave the industry um, so to me it's more of a mindset as opposed to actually whether or not you've been you know in healthcare or outside of healthcare for any amount of time i like the way you described it the outsider who comes in with a respect for the industry because you, you're right. Those that come in and think I know better and I'm going to disrupt them have all fallen <laughs> flat and headed away with their head between their tail. You know, they're like, like they, they, they are, they just don't, 
they don't if you don't respect the business the machine that is healthcare it'll eat you alive and spit you out right and, and so i agree i think if, if you come in with that perspective that says and, and it is a very arrogant perspective right like i know better than you and you don't know i mean it, that 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 kind of arrogance does not bode well in healthcare and gets you know thrown out but i do think on the other side, there's plenty of healthcare people are like, we've always done it this way and don't, (laughs) don't mess with us. Right. I mean, I I think that is just as scary, right? (laughs) Like that they can't accept change, you know, and, and there are a a fair number of people who are just like, well, we have to do it this way and this is how we've done it. And they just don't want to change. Right. I mean, I I don't think it's out, it's ill will or anything like that. Right. It's, it's just, that's what they're comfortable with. Right. And so, you know, the one I like is the outsider who comes in with a respect and partner. So I guess I'm going to cheat on the question, right? (laughs) Like you need a partnership of the two, right? The, the outside perspective has a healthy respect for healthcare and what's required and, and that there's reasons behind it. Like, you know, when you come in from outside of healthcare and you look at, you're like, why do you do this? And you know, you're like, this doesn't make any sense. And then as you spend more time, you're like, oh, okay it's still wrong. (laughs) You usually don't say like, Oh no, but at least you're like, okay, now I understand why it's done that way. You know, maybe there's an invested interest. Maybe there's fear of, of abuse, maybe whatever, right. There's all these internal perverse incentives that help explain why something that is dysfunctional, that needs disruption is the way it is. And then you can say, okay, now that I understand it, how can we disrupt it? Yeah, you definitely need, I mean, having a great idea, having a great thought, that's helpful, right? Mm -hmm. But you definitely need to be able to execute and implement it. And I think that does require somebody who knows how to navigate all the different players and the ecosystem of healthcare. I don't think you can be truly effective at implementing any kind of change without that kind of support. Now, maybe maybe you don't have to do it yourself. You can find someone like you just gave an example of, John, you know, that insider who's who knows all the players and is friends with them all and has spent years building those relationships. You want a team with someone like that to help, you know, implement whatever change you're proposing. I think without that, you know, it'll be years and years before we see those changes that people have ideas for. Did I just suggest they create more committees? Oh. There you go. <laughs> no, no committees, teams. It's fine. <laughs> and the leaders. <laughs> That's right. Hey, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Healthcare IT Today with John Lin and Colin Hunt. Today, we're discussing disruption in healthcare and whether it has to come from inside or outside the industry. So, so John, let me ask you this one. Um, is it more likely uh, for healthcare to be disrupted by an outside organization or by one uh, or, or are we going to disrupt ourselves? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm a Clayton Christensen uh, <laughs> innovator's dilemma. It's tough to disrupt yourself. So, you know, I, I think that the the one thing that does, you know, go for healthcare is the investment of in the in the infrastructure across the nation is is going to still be valuable. Like it, it, I don't think healthcare is going to be disrupted digitally the way many uh, other industries were, because things like surgeries still need to happen, and there there is still this in person component that is really valued. So, you know, that will I don't know if it'll ever be disrupted. I mean, it kind of is by surgery centers and different things like that. So I I guess there is some internal disruption in that regard, uh, but it seems like they're chomping those up as well, right? And taking advantage of those. Um, So I guess my, I would say on this regard, the outside organizations are going to nip at healthcare. And that's how I think they're going to disrupt it. They're going to nip at the edges, right? Walmart's going to nip at primary care and Amazon's going to do the same with Amazon care. And they're going to just nip at those edges, right? And and just take off some of these profitable spaces that are, are interesting, right? Surgery centers are nipping at the surgeries, right? And just outpatient surgeries that work better, you don't need to go to a hospital for, right? And so I think that you'll see that type of disruption, but what it's hard for me to see is how does that really scale 
and really just destroy healthcare and disrupt it in a way, you know, that Uber and Lyft have done to the taxi industry, right? Like it's hard for me to imagine that happening. And so I think there's still going to be a strong place for the, you know, the current healthcare organizations to, to force themselves to disrupt themselves. Right. And so maybe, you know, that's where we'll see more disruption. Uh, I'm going to take an opposite view here. Um, so I, I do think that, you know, having outside organizations like the Amazons and the, you know, to a certain degree, CVSs and Wal Walgreens and Walmarts of the world, uh, they'll definitely spur some change in healthcare at the macro scale because like, oh, Amazon's coming or, oh, Walmart's coming in or, you know, you know Ikea is coming in, right? <laughs> and building beds that are much cheaper, like whatever the case may be. And that will, that will cause us as, as, in, as uh, uh, healthcare insiders to, to make some change. But I think at a more micro scale, uh, we are capable and we are going to see some disruption that comes from internal organizations. I think, unfortunately, we're going to see some disruption happen when we start seeing some organizations fail or get close mm. to failure. I think when you're in that situation, you're going to change things, right? And, and you're going to change processes. You're going to change the way you approach your market and your community and so forth if you're, the hospital is in danger of closing, right? Um, or if the surgery center that you're running is, is in danger of losing patients, you're going to disrupt yourself. You're going to make change. So I think on a, on a micro scale, it, it will happen, but it takes an extreme event like that for, for mm -hmm. something to occur. Or you're going to have mass resignations, right, from your, from your team, and you'll have to change the way you, 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 know, you work and, and deal with your workforce. Um, yeah, I think the challenge is, is private equity going to come in and just take advantage of those situations. We've seen that happen in a bunch and, and then they don't necessarily innovate. They just squeeze the profits out, which is an unfortunate side effect sometimes. Yeah. And it could be, and you know, but I think also you look at organizations, you know, we've heard a few of them. We, we know of course uh, the good folks at Atrium, right. Uh, they're, they're doing some innovative things, right. They're just in, mm -hmm. in, could you call it disruption? I don't know. Building a hospital without any beds in it. It's pretty innovative. Yeah. Right? And Mercy and, and then, did the same. Right. And yeah, there's, there's a bunch that are doing it. So they're not their only one, like, you know, here uh, in Toronto, a women's college uh, hospital is doing the same thing. They're building an entire facility without any beds in it. So, so, you know, I, I look at that as that's pretty disruptive. Right. And, and would have, would an outside organization ever thought of that? I'm not sure. Right. You even look at a, a organization like Walmart. Um, why did they not just go right to telehealth, right? Why are they still insisting on actually having a physical clinic? Now it makes sense for them, obviously. Yeah, they want but, you shopping. <laughs> exactly, but but you kind of look at that and go, well, you know, are they going to be? Are they? Is that like the blockbuster to Netflix, right? Like, you know, they had. You can look at it that way. I look at, you know, would have would an outsider ever have thought to build a hospital without any beds in it? The answer is, I'm not sure they would have. Uh, because mm -hmm. I think they look at the current hospital market and go, well, you make money by having beds, you make money by having ORs. And anyway, I think there is going to be disruption that comes from internal folks. I think the other challenge is that healthcare is so regional and has regional nuances. So for example, in Utah, Intermountain dominates the healthcare there. So in some ways, they aren't forced to innovate. Now, they have a culture of innovation, and so they've done that. But what's interesting, when you dive in deeper to Intermountain, you realize, oh, well, in some ways, like on the clinical analytics side, they've done incredibly innovative things, right? Uh, but then there's probably other areas where, and eh, they didn't have to because they own the market. <laughs> and so they didn't need to do as many patient facing things as they needed to. Right. And so, you know, they have a culture that does it. And so they do push forward in ways that are interesting, but because they don't have the competition, they don't have to act a certain way. Whereas in Pittsburgh, there's two dominant players, right? So they kind of hold each other accountable, uh, you know, to that competition and they force each other to be more disruptive and more innovative because of that competition. And so I think that's going to be the other interesting thing to see play out is how are those competitive pressures regionally going to force disruption or not, right? And, and you know, there's an argument to be made, well, we're all competing with Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic, right? Uh, which in a digital world and 
you know, air, air, airplanes that go everywhere, we kind of are in, in some ways, right? But in others, the, yeah, a lot of people aren't going to go out to Mayo Clinic or they're not even going to know that those services are available. So healthcare is still local in many regards. So I think there's these regional nuances where sometimes you're forced to disrupt yourself because your competitor is, and sometimes you're not. <laughs> Now, I do also have to say, you know, given that given who we are, I mean, there's going to be some disruption happening from a technology front, right? You look at some of the robotic surgeries that are now possible, mm -hmm. right? And you go, well, that that really kind of opens the doors to things. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think there's definitely some technology disruption that's going to happen from from healthcare insiders, right? We, you know, we've been focusing a lot on on hospitals and providers of care, but there's a lot, there's a whole other part of the industry, right, around that. Also, pharma, I think some pharma, pharma tech you know, is capable of disrupting the industry. And I consider them insiders. Yeah, and it needs to in random, random clinical trials, right? Uh, you know, there's so much disruption options there. I was interested in the education, the med medical education piece. I did an interview recently with Oso VR, and it's essentially training surgeons vir using virtual reality. And that is a massive disruption to how you did it previously. And what's interesting is it's more about the repetitions. Mm -hmm. And that's what I didn't understand about the disruption is it's not so much that it's necessarily going to fully replace it, but it's going to provide all these repetitions so that then when you do it, it's familiar and you can do it regularly. And so anyway, I think there's disruptions on the medical edu education side. Interesting enough, the founder there decided to go to med school even though he really knew he wanted to be an entrepreneur, it's like, now that is investment in an outsider saying, I want to learn. <laughs> and he went to med school and became a surgeon. And of course, he's running a company, he still does surgery on the side. But, uh, you know, it, it's interesting this, you know, you know, he was kind of an outsider that said, hey, if I need to do this, someone told him you need to go to med school to really understand it. And he did. And sure enough, he's disrupting medical education as we know it. <laughs> So, so, John, who are some of the disruptors that we're going to be talking about over the next five to 10 years? Yeah, so I actually, you know, think that the most interesting ones are going to be the provider organizations. You know, I, I think that they have an opportunity here to do something interesting and so they're going to partner with some others, right? And that's going to be fine. So I look at, you know, clinical organizations that have a, a leader, you know, on our CIO podcast, we just had the innovation officer who came from American Express, you know, at, at Hogue, you know, doing interesting things in, in, in California and, and really pushing forward these ideas of patient centricity that I think is going to be interesting. You know, Rasu at Atrium that you already mentioned, uh, it'll be interesting to see what they do because he is saying, you know, the right things as far as let's do what's right for the patient and everything else will work out. That's a different mindset than many organizations have taken. So I'm interested to see what those provider organizations will do. And I think there's, there's a bunch of others that have investment arms. And I think that's really interesting. Providence has proven that model and with what they do with their investment in technology to innovate. And so they can innovate in a kind of startup mentality, but still with, you know, tied to the health system and knowing, hey, how is this going to impact the patient experience and clinical care? Um, Houston, there's, there's an amazing CIO, Roberta there that, you know, she's doing some amazing things as well. So those are a few that I like those industry people. I think that they, you know, because healthcare is so entrenched, I'm fascinated by what they can do. And of course they're partnering with other outside organizations to do it, but uh, I like what they're doing. I think for me, one of the disruptors we'll be talking about over the next uh, five to 10 years is actually employers, right? Oh, um, because currently they're the ones funding care and, mm -hmm. and either they won't in five to 10 years <laughs> or, or they will continue to, but they'll be demanding much better return. Uh, or much different ways of providing care to their employees that are also demanding it. Um, I think they're sort of the unheralded uh, uh, disruptor because they're, they're holding some of the cards, right? And yet they have not traditionally been part of the conversations. You know, the exceptions being, you know, big, big employers like GM and Ford and Boeing and so forth. But I expect that 
especially with all the things that uh, were happening before the pandemic that was gaining momentum about employers changing the way they were uh, giving out or, or administrating uh, medical uh, benefits. Um, I'm expecting that to continue now, now that we're coming out of the pandemic. I think we're going to return to the point where we see employers taking a much more active role and making more demands and, and forcing healthcare to change or they'll find alternatives. Yeah. No, it's a good prediction. I mean, Glenn Tolman knows how to make money. And of course, he's gone that direction with transparent and <laughs> investing right. in the employer side, because that is the organization that has the most to gain or lose, I, I, I think, from it, right? And I think, unfortunately, as patients, we don't, we, we can't do what we need to to really affect change, but employers can in, in, in a bigger way, I think, than, than patients. And I'm sure some of my patient advocates will be like, no, we're going to make a noise. And, and they do, right? And they make you know small impacts. But yeah, I think the employers have the power. So that, that's a pretty good prediction. I like that comment. Yeah, I mean, just, you know, and, and so in a weird way, I think Microsoft will have a much bigger impact as an employer than they do as a technology provider in healthcare, <laughs> right? Because they're just the number of employees employees they have, the, the pull they have, if they decided, for example, to open up, you know, Microsoft for health, like meaning actual provide health to their own employees. Yep. I mean, imagine the trend that would set, right? And say, hey, let's listen, it's cheaper for us to provide our own care than it is to farm it out. And, you know, we're going to manage things now and, and do these kinds of things. I, I think there's some potential there if, if companies start to threaten to do that, that well, all of a sudden you'll see change. I think Amazon's even more in a position to do that because they've done it before. Yeah. Uh, you know, they started using UPS and FedEx and then they started doing their own. And now UPS and FedEx are paying Amazon to deliver packages. Like that's a transformation. And we've seen they've done, they're starting that way in healthcare. They started with Amazon care for their employees because they had so many and they need to deal with it. And then they roll it out to the consumers and eventually providers are going to be working for Amazon or I don't know. We'll, <laughs> we'll see how that plays out. <laughs> we could, we could get there one day, John, we could get there one day. Yep. <laughs> all right. Listen, thanks to all of you who've turned into this episode of Healthcare IT Today. You can find out more about our show by checking out the programs page on healthcarenowradio.com. And please share your voice and engage with the community at healthcareittoday.com and on Twitter using the hashtag HITSM. I'm Colin Hung with my friend and health IT collaborator, John Lin. Thanks for listening and have a great week. <laughs>